Jessica. Hi. Um, I was born in Germany to military parents. Um, I came over here when I was four. Can you hear me? Here. I came over here. I, I will be. I came over here when I was four to Washington, um, to the west side of the state, and my little brother was born here. And that same year, my mom left us. Um, she, my dad was really abusive, and she saved herself and left me and my brother with my dad, who um, blamed us for that. And so it was never really a good home life. Um, he was angry, he was hurt, all the things. Um, I never really got close to anybody growing up. One, I had abandonment issues from my mom, and uh, my dad had a lot of women in and out of our lives all the time, um, and he was married a lot of times. And so we had women moving in with us with their children. They would be around maybe six months or a year, and then either they would move out or we would move out. We moved schools a lot of times, and um, I, I just never was able to get close to people. Um, my grandma was a constant person in my life all the time, so me and her were super close. When I was 12 years old, my uncle molested me, and right after that, I started drinking really heavily and um, started having parties at my house, and I would have older people come around, and I kind of felt, um, I don't want to say cool, but I felt like people kind of wanted to hang out with me, and that was a first for me. Um, it caused a lot, of, a lot of conflict in our family. My mom and my aunt didn't believe me, and so um, I felt like it was my fault because of that. Um, I already struggled with not feeling loved in my family, and now I didn't feel safe or protected um, or anything by the people who should have been protecting me. Um, by the time I was 13, I was doing other drugs, um, smoking weed and doing acid and mushrooms, and um, I think I smoked shroom a couple times. Started early. Um, and then by the time I was, bless you, by the time I was 14, um, I got pregnant with my first daughter. Um, oh, so there was a lot of men in my life too, because that's what I learned. Um, so by the time I was 14, I was pregnant with my oldest daughter. Her dad was 19, so he went to prison for rape of a child. And so I had my oldest daughter in the summer of eighth grade, and I was alone in that, because my dad already didn't like me, so he wasn't gonna help me, and now her dad wasn't there either. So I got kicked out almost immediately, and um, me and her would go from house to house. I was drinking again, doing drugs, and um, all the things. By the time I was 16, I was shooting meth and heroin. And um, things got really crazy really fast after that. Uh, we, I never really had my own place, so me and my daughter would stay where we could. Um, I would do whatever I had to do to keep myself high all the time. Um, by the time I was 18, I went to jail. And so I brought some pictures. Wow. A lot of them. <laughs> A whole lot of them. <laughs> so I'm just gonna let those go while I'm talking. Um, shortly after, shortly after I was 18, I went to prison for the first time, and I lost custody of my oldest daughter to my mom, right? My mom, who left me and my brother, but wanted to take care of my daughter. So now I hated her even more. Hated her. Um, I got out of prison and went right back to the same thing, but now I didn't have a baby to, well, she wasn't a baby. I didn't have a, my daughter with me anymore to drag along, so I just went hard and went right back to prison. And uh, the second time I got out of prison, um, same thing, you know, I always went back to the same thing, but this time I got pregnant again with my son, Arian, and um, I couldn't stop using the whole time I was pregnant with him. I didn't see a doctor the whole time. Well, I saw a doctor the last week before he was born, but I could not stop using. Um, and I didn't want to get high, but I could not do it. 
every time I would get high, my body would physically, violently reject it, and I did it anyways. I just couldn't stop. Um, two, oh, about a week and a half before he was born, again, I got arrested again, and they put me into a six-month inpatient treatment in Everett, and um, they had me see a doctor. I had to see a doctor every single day for that last week until he was born, and he was born December 19th with no drugs or alcohol in his system. And then um, I was clean for maybe a couple months after I got out of treatment. I got into, they helped me get into my own place, first place I've ever had on my own, um, where I wasn't living with somebody else or some guy. And I relapsed quickly again and got pregnant again with Chloe. And so, yeah, so, <laughs> got pregnant. There's a pattern here, see it? Um, so I got pregnant with Chloe. I was sober from most of the pregnancy with her, but um, still, I mean, same thing. When she was born, I went back to the same thing. Her dad went to, well, so Arian's dad was a one night stand, sorry. Um, and Chloe's dad went to prison while I was pregnant with her for 10 years. So um, I was alone again with these kiddos. And um, in 2011, I thought I could do like a um, location change and that would change things, right? So I came to Spokane and um, I was sober for a very short amount of time. I was going to AA, I had a sponsor um, doing some things, but that didn't work out very well for me either. So I met a guy, that's what I do. Um, and actually, um, this person was probably the most important person to me of all of the people. I never really close to me or um, let people love me or love people. So this person, uh, I was with the longest. He stuck around. I don't know why. But I was, I was doing a lot of crimes to um, support my habit. Um, I had a lot of people in and out of my house all the time, and um, I, my house, well, so things got crazy again here in Spokane, and my house got raided, my car got seized, and I got 29 charges, felony charges filed on me, and so Joshua, that's the person who um, I was with at the time, he got caught up by DOC, and they put him in treatment. So I was um, being evicted from my place because they frown on it when you get raided. And the landlord ne lived next door. Um, my boyfriend was in treatment, so I was alone again. Um, I had 29 charges. Um, and so my life was looking pretty hopeless. Um, I was on the phone with Joshua one night from treatment and I was I just remember crying and I was telling him how horrible everything was and he was like what do you want me to do you want me to come home and I kind of did uh, I didn't want to be by myself doing all the stuff and he was like um, everything's gonna be okay God's got a plan God's got you and I was pissed because <laughs> I was high I was high and on my little poor me, you know, like this guy wants to talk about God. He used to always get high and talk about God. Um, and I hated it and I was pissed. I wanted him to feel sorry for me and what I was going through, right? No. Um, so he was like, do you believe that? No, I do not believe that. I do not believe that God loves me, that um, he's gonna save me or that he has a plan for me or my life, right? Because where has he been this whole time? It's been a train wreck and God wasn't there. And he was like, well, you just have to believe it. I didn't want to believe it. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it at all. And he said, just say it. <laughs> I'm not gonna just say it. He said, just say it. And, and I couldn't say it. I did not believe that. 
So he prayed for me before um, he got off the phone, and that night um, in my room, I was crying so hard, and I just said a little prayer. I don't even remember what I said, but I said a little prayer, and I cried myself to sleep. And the next day, I woke up, and um, I haven't got loaded since then. That was five years ago in January. Yeah. So um, I had to do a little bit of work myself there. We were being evicted. I was waiting for the sheriffs to show up any day. So I went over to my friend's house and started looking for a place. And I came across this place on a housing site or whatever. It said, no felons, no drugs, no evictions, <laughs> no pets. Must make three times the amount of rent. I did not have a job. Josh was in treatment. I was being evicted. I had pets all the things, and I'm really not sure, I mean, now looking back, clearly it was God, but at the time, why would I even call that guy? But I did, and I went and met with him, and he did not run a background check, he did not ask me any questions, he did not ask how I was gonna pay the rent, he just said, when do you wanna move in? So, yeah, so we moved into that place in February, and um, all the time, I still was dealing with all the charges. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you. So after I said that prayer and cried myself to sleep that night, strange things started happening. Like, <laughs> the Mormons showed up the next day. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. The Mormons showed up, because apparently Josh had befriended them when he was high, um, and prayed with them. So they stopped by to ask where Josh was at. And I told him he was in treatment, and they were really excited for him. And they said, well, is there anything we can do for you? Can we pray for you? And so they did. They prayed for me. They came about twice a week for a few weeks and prayed with me, um, prayed for me, prayed for Josh, prayed for my kids. And um, they never tried to push anything on me. It was nothing more than they just came and prayed for me. So then I was in this back to the apartment. I um, got into the place and I had no way to pay the rent. So I started looking for jobs. No place would hire me because I had 29 charges pending against me and I had maybe two weeks clean and it was very apparent. <laughs> so no place would hire me. So I started posting on Craigslist, right? I will clean up dog poop. I will watch your kids. I will clean your house. I will do whatever. And I started getting calls um, to clean houses, and so that's what I started doing. My neighbor worked for SNAP, and she said, I have a house that nobody will touch. I said, well, I gotta pay my rent, so let's do it. And um, when they went to um, pay me, they wanted my EIN, right? I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and um, they said, well, you can keep doing jobs for us, but you gotta get licensed. Okay, so I got licensed. And um, that's how I started my business that I still have today. And um, all this time I was going to court. I showed up every single time for court. Um, my attorney was trying to um, get me into DOSA, get me into um, drug court, get me anything so that I could stay with my kids. And um, the attorney, the prosecuting attorney wasn't going for it. He did not like me at all. And um, I just kept showing up and I kept pleading not guilty and he kept saying, nope, tell her to get her, um, tell her to get her affairs in order for her kids. So that's what I did. And I made arrangements for where my kids would go because um, I was probably going back to prison again. And then one day uh, my attorney called me and she said, I need you to come down here. So. I went down there and she said, the prosecutor has uh, made an offer for you. And uh, this offer was better than any offer that we had tried to get. Um, I pled guilty to 16 charges, eight money laundering charges, and the other eight were identity theft, trafficking stolen property, forgery, multiples of all those. And um, I did no time, not one single day. Um, I got into a program called FOSA, 
and so it was a family program, kind of like DOSA, but your whole family does it with you. So I spent a lot of time with my DOC lady. She came to my house and did a mouth swab every single week. Um, I had to send every single address that I went to uh, work at to her. She said not only was she protecting them, but she said she was protecting me that way too. And um, God just really started showing up. I, I had to do some of the work. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. I still had a hard time letting people get close to me. I was really closed off, but I just kept showing up. I started going to a church and a Bible study with a couple of my friends. Um, I got really involved with that church. I was volunteering there, and there was a situation, and they ran my background, and I was no longer allowed to volunteer there anymore. Um, so I got my feelings hurt and left that church, but right before that, me and my daughter, um, got baptized together, August of 2019, <laughs> side by side in the river, side by side in the river. Um, my kids started trusting me again. Um, my mom came into my life, that was cool. I hated her, <laughs> still hated her, um, but I was forgiven, right? So, um, and I had done a lot of things, so I, I really had to work on forgiving her um, my oldest daughter had written me off a long time ago, long time ago, and she um, was talking to my daughter one day, and she just asked to talk to me. It was so cool. I think it was Christmas Eve, maybe, and she asked to talk to me, and um, God has completely restored those relationships in my life. So my um, in April, me and... Chloe will be flying down to spend a week with my daughter, and then um, Chloe graduates in June, and my yeah. daughter and my granddaughter will be flying up here. Yeah. So they'll be here. Um, let's see. God showed me every single day that he did love me and that he did have a plan for me the whole time. Um, I started coming to recovery the very first day, out in the tent. We were out in the tent. <laughs> and I've been here ever since. Um, he started tearing down some of the walls, and I started doing a step group here, and I I've done it a few times now, but the first time, um, I started to learn who I was in Christ. <laughs> I learned how to set boundaries, because I had really bad boundaries. Um, I learned that I was not defined by the things that I did. Amen. I worked the steps again. I learned how to have relationships with women. I learned what I liked and did not like because I had no idea any of that. Um, I learned how to let people love me, and most importantly, I learned how to love other people. God has given me a completely new life. He has broken my chains. He has broken the generational curses in my family. He has restored the relationships. Yes. Looking back, I can see that God was there all along. It was me that wanted to let him <laughs> allow him in. <laughs> right? This is the longest that I've been sober since I was 12 years old. I have a peace like nothing I've ever felt. I'm still learning, but I can clearly see that God had a plan for me and my family the whole time. And then I'm going to end with this. Um, when we were down at the Dream Center, there was a guy named Eddie. And he's, he told us a little bit of his testimony, and then he said, I just want to thank you guys for praying for me. He's like, because when you pray for the still-suffering addict, he was like, that was me. And that really hit me home, um, because when I was at Bible study at Alicia Doney's house one time, there was a lady there, and um, I friended her on Facebook, and she said, hey, we have a mutual friend. Um, how do you know this person? And I said, oh, man, I love her family. Uh, we do, um, I can't look at her, <laughs> we do family dinner at her house every Sunday night, and um, our daughters are best friends, and she was the one that was going to take my kids if I went back to prison. <coughs> and the girl sitting next to me, who I had only met a couple times, says, I know who you are. We used to pray for you at Anna Ogden Hall. <laughs> 
So thank you for praying for me, Kay. And that's all. All right, I think we're going to have the worship team come up. No. No, coins. just kidding. We're going to do coins. So, uh, Jen and Angela, why don't you guys make your way to the stage? We'll get some music going. Woo! Give it up for Jessica one more time. Oh, my goodness, it is a packed house. I'm Jen. This is Angela. Um, we're going to hand out some coins. That was amazing, Jessica. I love you. And I am so happy to be doing life with you. Um, so the first coin that we're giving out tonight, well, before I give coins, um, I just want to let you guys know, no matter like what you're going through in life, having recovery and having people there to support you in your recovery is so amazing. The last year has been the worst year of my life. I lost my dad a year ago yesterday. And two days after he passed away, I stood up here. So a year ago today, stood up here and gave my testimony. It was the hardest thing I had ever done in my whole entire life. But because of the people and the family that I have here, I was able to stand up here and do that. And so no matter where you're at in your recovery, one day, 12 years, five years, we're here. And we're here to support you. Um, the most important coin, I think, to get is your one-day coin. Whether you're at one day or somewhere in between one and 30 days, it is the most important coin. It gives you something to hold on to when you're struggling, something to just, when you're alone and you just or have that urge or whatever, you can hold it. And it's just some to grasp onto. So we're gonna start with one day. Anybody have one day or somewhere between one and 30 days? Come up and get it. <laughs> Woo! You got one day. Like, I mean, that's the hardest. All right, next we got 30 days. Do we have any 30 days out there? Sixty days. Woo!
years. No, four years, how about five years? Okay, five years? Five years. Five years. Woo! What's up, everybody? How's it going? Do you guys wonder what I got in the sack? Okay, I'm going to show you. I'm reminded of this rock right here, okay? So now back in biblical times, the biblical patriarch would have a thing called an Ebenezer stone. And they would go to the river, and they would help build their altar up there. And each and every time they went by that, it was a remembrance. God had brought them through. Amen. What God had done in their life. Amen. And they would carry it around, maybe smaller stones, but could you imagine every time you wanted to think of God, carrying around this stone? Yeah. Feel a little awkward, wouldn't it? Yeah. Now, let's fast forward to the 40s. This is before chips were made and all that fun stuff. Guess what they did? They started handing out what are these? Poker chips. They would give them a poker chip, something a little bit lighter than the rocks to carry around, right? <laughs> Now we have, of course, coins that we hand out. So we're going to start coin on these guys. Think, oh. <laughs> is it is it one day? Anybody in here got 24 hours, 72 hours, just got out of jail? Anything like that? Okay. All right. All right. We can move forward. No shame here either. There is a day. All right. I like it. Come on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So good. Good job, brother. That's awesome, Steven. Of course, after that, what do we have? 30 days. Anybody have 30 days out here? About 30 days. Man, I can remember coming into a coin night. That was the highlight, as Sarah was saying earlier, was coming to Friday. Can you imagine where we used to be at on a Friday night? Where were we? Out in a trap house or at the bar? One of the two, right? Not at church, that's for sure. Okay, we got 60 days. Anybody got 60 days? All right. I feel bad for Dallas, sorry. He's a Dallas fan. <laughs> so awesome to see the lights come on, isn't it? That first 60 days. How about 90 days? I forget what's after 90 days. What is after 90 days? Is it? Is it? Oh, we got somebody. All right. Mr. Chris here. <laughs> Make no mistake, we're all in recovery from something, right? We're all in recovery from something. We got nine months. Anybody? Did I do six? What do you got right down here? I'm sorry. Was that six? This is Uncle Glenn. From Dope to Hope, right here. (laughs) 
This guy is a perfect example. This is Uncle Glenn, perfect example of complete turnaround right here, okay? That's to let you know that God that begun a good work in you will complete it till the end. Sometimes we take a little detour, it takes a little longer to get there, but make no mistake, he'll finish his work in you. Amen? All right. What do we got now after nine months? We got the brass. We got one year out here. Anybody got one year? How about 18 months? Anybody got 18 months? That's a hard one, believe it or not. At 18 months, I wound up relapsing. I was in my four step, and that's where you kind of like do the searching and fearless moral inventory, and you got to write all this stuff out and dig all this stuff out. And I never went with my sponsor on the fifth step. I sat on my four step for a couple weeks, and then all of a sudden, I was snuck into a grocery store, then went back in and said, hey, I could get a bottle of wine. Next thing I know, it's up in the rafters, right? And I'm sneaking it, hiding it on a three-day bender. And guess who I found at the bottom of the bottle again? I found Jesus. There he was. Took a couple more bottles, but I found him. <laughs> we got two years. Three years. Four years. Right, we know the man, the myth, the legend. This is Matthew Wheeler. He's been down to Dream Center, back and forth, clean and sober today. It's a beautiful testimony. Proud of you, Matt. We got the big five, 60 months, right? We got six years. We used to count it out like that. Remember the beginning? I got three days, 17 hours, and four minutes, right? <laughs> Seven years, eight years, nine years, 10 years. I'll keep counting, 11 years, 12 years, 13 years. I don't, is there anybody after 13 years you think out here that actually has that long of sobriety? Can you believe that? <laughs> we have a good friend out here who's a huge part of Northbridge recovery, huge part of recovery in the city of Spokane as well. His name is Casey Hendrickson. Come on up, 14 years. <laughs> My fear coin, just so you go. Oh. This, this, come here, come here. I ordered this uh, special 14 year coin for Casey because I love him so much, and it has a phoenix rising on the front of it and a phoenix rising. Uh, see if I can remember it. A phoenix rising represents strength and uh, transformation. And a phoenix can rise out of its own ashes and leave the past of the dust of the ashes of its past behind and rise to <laughs> greater heights. And that's what I've been watching him do for 10 years. I'm proud of you.